Hey listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Today's program has been brought to you by Heritage Foods USA, the nation's largest distributor of heritage breed pigs and turkeys. For more information, visit heritagefoodsusa.com. Hey, what's up? This is Jack Inslee, host of Full Service Radio. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this show, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. Right. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Heritage Radio Network. We are coming to you, as always, live from the back of Roberta's Pizza here in Bushwick, Brooklyn. It's a lovely day. Uh, you have tuned into the Farm Report. I'm your host, Aaron Fairbanks, and we are excited to welcome back to the Farm Report Sarah Teal of the Adirondack Grazers. Sarah, welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you. It's good to have you back. I feel like since... Since the last time I had you on, I've learned how to actually say Adirondack. Uh, it was a real challenge for me last time, and I just want to get some credit for, for learning the correct pronunciation. I know. Well done. <laughs> so um, for folks who, who um, aren't familiar with the Grazers, you know, you guys started a beef cooperative in upstate New York back in May 2012 with, with uh, a group of eight farms. Can you talk a little bit about how you initially got going and, and give us an update as, as to where you're at here in 2014? Um, well, things are, going, things are going very well. Things have, um, we have grown. We now have 32 farm members, and um, I think we're going to get it our first million in sales this year, so that's good. Um, we've grown, and it's, it, it, you know, it's been an, ex, an interesting journey trying to get, to get there, but um, it looks like it's working out. So that is good. We've picked up new customers and um, a lot of new farms, and we now we even have a little office and we have a staff. So things are, things are going well. Awesome. And then for folks who maybe aren't so familiar, can you share with us a little bit about, you know, why start this cooperative um, and kind of what exactly it is that you guys do? Um, well, uh, I started the cooperative because we have a farm upstate on the New York-Vermont border. And a lot of the farmers around me were going out of business, including our local farmer who farmed our farm. And um, I just thought if they would be able to sell their beef, which was fantastic, I knew it was, to New York City, then um, they could maybe hang on to their farms and not have to go out of business. And a lot of people were dairy, um, but they'd always kept a few beef. And I just thought, well, if when they give up the dairy, which is what was happening, um, but expanded the beef, then they could carry on. So um, we started a grass-fed beef herd, and I realized you couldn't do it just as one farm. So we um, started a cooperative <laughs> um, with the Cornell um, Cooperative Extension helping us out. And um, we started with eight farmers and then 12, and it's um, grown. And what it means is that they can keep their independence, and they are part of um, a farmer-owned group. Um, and we take a very small percentage of every sale, the co-op does, but they're getting the top dollar for their beef. And um, so we've been making um, we've been making money for farmers, which is the purpose of it, and really is a kind of a 
a farm rescue, <laughs> farm rescue program. Um, but it is also to get healthy beef into the city, healthy local beef into the city, which when you and I last talked, um, you know, it's a challenge. It's still a challenge. And the transportation part of it is, is the last bit we've got to get right. But um, we, are, we are doing it, which is the exciting thing. Yeah, it's happening. And we're going to talk a little bit later in the program about the Kickstarter campaign that you guys have have going on. Um, but, bef- but before we get there, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of the, pro- the process of, of what, what you're doing. So you're selling food uh, direct to consumers or into retail shops or who are some of like your main customers? Well, um, luckily, we, we sell to you guys. So um, we send down uh, a whole animal to Emily at the Heritage Butcher Shop in Essex Street Market every other week. Um, but our, our main and biggest customer um, right now is Fresh Direct. So we have been, we started with them in the fall. Um, we started slow and sending a few animals, and we built it up to sending 10 beef every other week, and now we're on 10 a week. Um, and that's been, that's been good because they, like you guys, you know, they came out and they um, toured the farms and they inspected us and they've been, we meet with them constantly and we've been building a sort of slow program. And so they are at this point the largest customer, but we're also selling to um, Fleischer's, which is fantastic, and um, Gramercy Tavern, um, which, we, which we love. Um, and then to um, a market, one in Albany and one in Saratoga. Um, we, we find that for us, um, the wholesale is what we can manage. If, if it comes to managing small pieces of beef for individual restaurants, um, we can't handle that. It, it's too much work. So we send um, also to a group called um, Main Street Wholesale in Farmingdale, and restaurants can order from them, and they get to worry about little pieces of beef and not us. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't handle it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's a lot. I think folks often forget how much of a, you know, one, how large um, a head of beef is, but also how much of that ends up being, you know, uh, ground meat or, or bones or offal or other parts that you're not usually seeing on the menu um, in, in restaurants across you know, the city and across the country. Um, with regards to the growth in farmers, um, that's really exciting to see that, you know, you've grown from eight initial farms to 32. And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit, um, on average, of what these farms look like. You had mentioned there's a lot of people transitioning out of the dairy industry into the beef industry. Um, I'm just wondering if you can give us a little scope of, of or profile of, of your farmers, if they're typical or maybe What's a typical group and maybe some of the atypical uh, folks who are part of the co-op? Yeah. Um, the, the, the nice thing about a co-op, actually, is that it, we, can, we can encompass any size farm because we're a group. Um, so if we're sending 10 a week, we can either send 10 from one farm or two from here and two from here. You know, we, um, so we have a variety of sizes. We have small Herds, I guess the smallest are probably around about 40 or 50 um, because most um, are cow-calf operations. So they're enclosed herds, and um, that's good because we know exactly where everything's coming from. Um, but then they go all the way up to, I suppose, the biggest herds are around about three or 400. Um, and, and they vary. Most of them are farmer-owned and operated, which is the point. Um, some of them... Are, um, have farm managers and are owned by, you know, guys who might be working in the city. But there's a, just a few of those. Um, but it's helpful to have those because they're often the larger herds, and that means that they can balance things out with the small ones. If we only were had small farms, it would be um, very difficult to keep it all balanced. Um, but we like a sort of range. <laughs> Um, mainly what we're looking for is um, either farmers or farm managers who really understand soil and pasture management and the importance of their grass and then um, the health of their animals and the genetics. So, and the breed. Um, 
you know, um, we very um, concerned that they're, they're using good breeds that are good on grass. So that's what we're looking for. And we, then we don't really mind how big or small they are. Right, right. So you've established at some point some some kind of basic criteria so when someone approaches, you can kind of make a decision about whether or not they're going to be a good fit. Yes. And now the, the good thing we have, we've always had very strong protocols, but now we have a young woman called Ashley Bridge who um, gets in the car and she goes off and visits everybody. And um, she knows exactly what she's looking for. She really is informed about all of this. She goes to all the conferences, the grass conferences, and um, she will go and visit the farm and take photographs, and she fills in a questionnaire, and then the board votes on whether to include them as a member because we're, we're trying very hard to keep the standards high and the consistency strong. So um, it's been important to have someone go out and visit so yeah. that's what we do now. So. I feel like there's no there's um, no excuse for getting your, your feet on the ground. I mean, I definitely learned a ton yeah. when we were able to come up and, and visit a couple of the farms with you. Um, well, it's interesting that you talk about kind of the the kind of benefits of having a diversity of farmers with regards to um, kind of size. I, and I think that's one thing that um, I find so interesting about, you know, regional farm economies is, is that we, we need that diversity. You need kind of a multitude of, of players to kind of make things work. And, and you had touched on yeah. some of the other components that make your business work or not work. So in addition to the farmers, um, I'm assuming it's also kind of slaughterhouses and processing facilities and then transportation. So maybe starting with the slaughter facilities, can you talk a little bit about, you know, as you guys have seen such a, a, an increase in, in the number of animals that you're processing, um, has there been the, the resource in the slaughter space? Um, and do you continue to, you know, does, if the answer is yes, does it seem like that's going to continue to be a space that's able to grow as you guys grow? Yeah, no, that's always that's always the question. And we've we started with um, Eagle Bridge Custom Meats, and we have now a pretty solid relationship with those guys. You know, we've um, spent a lot of time working together to work this out, and so we've been able to increase our slot with Eagle Bridge, which is great. And again, slow but sure. And they've increased their space and their freezer space, and so. We've been growing as they've been growing, and that's the good thing about doing this is that, you know, you can grow if there's a consistency of market, too. Um, and then we're using um, um, New York Custom Processing in Bridgewater, which is bigger. Um, and then there are some new ones opening up. So we've started relationships with some – there's a new one in Ticonderoga and different places – and then um, we're expanding into Vermont, so now we've been working with a, um, a slaughterhouse there. So in in some senses, that's gotten better because people have known now for a while that, that the lack of slaughterhouses is a problem, and they've been opening that up and, um, or expanding current ones. Um, but the big uh, problem is transportation, <laughs> and that's my current obsession, is that, you you know, there is no local system in place so um, we were relying on regional access and then they decided they weren't going to pick up at Eagle Bridge anymore so that left us and the various other people stranded Um, and luckily I think you guys know Mark from Fresh Connection and so Mark jumped in and he's been fantastic Um, but it slightly doesn't make sense there needs to be a bigger more cohesive um, local transportation system in place, and that's what we're working on next: is to get a hub going in Hunts Point um, for local meat, which there isn't right now. Um, and so we we're really going to try um, every angle. We're working with different groups, like the New York Economic De- um, Development Council and people, to put that piece in place because um, it's it is one of the things about local foods everywhere. Um, but there isn't transportation. You know, they're just used to big, big trucking companies. Yeah, and I think that's one of so. the the interesting things about the co-op model is that you know you have one group with with many voices. You know, you guys have some weight behind you in those conversations as you look to legislators and policymakers. Um, and the transport yep. the transportation issue being literally, you know, you need someone to 
pick the meat up from the slaughter facility and deliver it to the city. I mean, it's not yeah. much more complicated the, the than ideal. that. Yeah, no, um, it, but, but if you, um, you know, if you have a big enough truck, you know, it's very hard. There's only one guy driving it. And dropping, you know, at Gramercy Tavern, the poor guy has to, has to carry in this, these heavy, you know, half a cow. <laughs> or he's coming to Emily at uh, Essex Street Market. And you have to park that thing, carry everything in, and you're the only person. Hope that you don't get a ticket in the meantime and and try and find parking. And it's it's kind of crazy. It would make much more sense if we could all of us get together and create a hub and hunt point and have one big truck pick up from all the slaughterhouses, drop everything at a, a hub and hunt point, and then have Mark or someone um, from Fresh Connect and pick it, pick it up and just do local runs. Um, that would make more sense than what we're all trying to do individually right now. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, I, I definitely spent uh, a good year making uh, driving the truck from Flying Pigs Farm down to the city and, yes, and so making. You know. So I know I was, I you know, a study in uh, the inefficiencies. Um, of the local system. And I think also the thing that I felt was so striking and, and re- like a real lesson to me from my time on the farm is, God damn, you have to be good at so many things. And if, you know, you're trying to focus on, you know, maintaining a great pasture and the genetic integrity of your livestock and caring for your animals and the veterinary needs and, you know, managing, you, you know, your family and those aspects of, of that business. And then, you know, coordinating with slaughter facilities and then having a, a place to sell your final product that makes sense. And then all of a sudden you have to be a, a delivery person and an expert on the trucking <laughs> routes. And, you yes. know, gosh, there's still just 24 hours in a day and it just seems like, um, too, you know, it's too, it's too, much. too much. It's too much. So um, we are going to take just a quick break. And when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about the film project and the Kickstarter campaign and And um, I'm excited to hear a little bit more about that. So hang tight. You are listening to The Farm Report, and we'll be right back. Heritage Foods USA has sold pasture-raised, antibiotic-free heritage meats to restaurants and homes around the country. Our farmers raise their animals with care using traditional methods guaranteed to produce the very best-tasting meat. Our pork breeds include Berkshire, Red Wattle, Duroc, Gloucester Old Spot, Large Black, and Tamworth, and our beef comes from Piedmontese, Angus Akiyushi, Belgian Blue, Highland, Simmental, and Belted Galloway cattle. We also carry a rotation of 24 rare breeds of heritage chicken, seasonal specialties like lamb, goat, geese, and of course, heritage turkeys. Visit us online at www.heritagefoodsusa.com or give us a call at 718-389-0985 to place your order today. All right, we are back. You're listening to The Farm Report, and I'm your host, Aaron Fairbanks. We are on the line with Sarah Teal of Adirondack Grazers. So one of the other kind of um, themes of your work, I think some of the inspiration was, you know, looking around and seeing um, the, the closing of farms in your area. And, um, you know, if there's no farms, there's no food. But if there's no kind of way for there's no kind of economic imperative. It, it's hard for farmers to, to stay in business. And here in New York State, um, we're kind of in trouble. Can you talk a little bit about the state of, of farmland that inspired you guys to make this film? Yeah, no, we, we started filming with our farmers um, in the summer of 2012 because we thought it would be my friend Lisa Jackson, who's also a She's an Emmy Award-winning documentary filmmaker, and, and we, so am I, and we thought, oh, it would be fun to do little posts on the web so that people, customers, could see exactly where their farm, their beef was coming from, and you could look up the farm, and, and there'd be a little portrait of the farmers and, and their land and their cows. And then we realized that actually 
especially the people who first started the Adirondack Grazers were a very fantastic and eccentric lot and very, very different from each other. So we just kept filming. Um, and then we realized that um, actually this is a, a small story that tells a much bigger story. And the bigger story is the loss of family farms, and it's a, a national story. It's an international story, actually. But um, New York State is losing a farm every three days. And um, it's scary. And we're looking at, you know, um, 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 it's been a disaster for a while, but it's really getting very bad. And so we thought we would wanted to highlight that and we wanted to pay attention to that. And um, documentary is a good way because then you can, it, it becomes about people and emotions and you see what happens when someone, you know, is looking at losing their land. And... Um, and you can see how hard it is to have put something like this together. We didn't. Everybody was so great. They didn't. Um, they didn't uh, edit themselves. <laughs> they just. They, you know, there's plenty of fights that we filmed um, because it's hard doing this. And and you know, they had their. Some of them had their farms at stake. And um, so we wanted to highlight some much bigger issues than just um, a few New York farmers putting a talk together. Um, and that's what's been happening. And, and I have never done Twitter before, but or Kickstarter. But the Kickstarter has been amazing because we wanted to raise a little bit to finish the film. Um, but with it, we have this fantastic assistant called Amy Gaines. And Amy has been doing um, tweeting and um, tumbling and Facebooking. And <laughs> she put the Kickstarter campaign together. And it's been fantastic. The number of people that have tweeted us out there. You know, um, Michael Anthony started it off at Gramercy Tavern, and now Mario Batali and Mark Bittman did it the other day, which was fantastic. He has 430,000 followers from the New York Times. So it's, it's, I think it's been a way of raising a conversation about the loss of family farms um, in New York, but across the country. And um, for that purpose, it's been fantastic, the people that have been tweeting us yeah well kind of putting that putting that storyline out there well in the yeah. kind of trailer on on the um on the kickstarter page you talk a little bit about um some numbers uh i think if i'm correct me if i'm wrong but 3.1 million acres of farmland in the state that's currently lying fallow and then that a farm yep. farm closes in new york state every three days did i get those right yep 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 it's 1.3 million acres that is being unused. So whenever people like the, um, the head of Chipotle the other day was defending the fact he's buying grass-fed beef from Australia because he says there isn't enough around, which is ridiculous because there is and um, the capacity to grow is really there. You know, if we just took over those 1.3 million former farm acres, and when, when a farm is out, I mean, the, the land turns back to scrub really quickly in two years. It's kind of frightening. It, it, it goes back to scrub. And this is beautiful farmland. And um, it's, a, it's a tragedy because we, we are losing these family farms. And it, um, it's, it's not, it's not going to be good for any of us. Yeah, when I think as we, as we talked about in the first half of the show, there is a little bit of a, a domino effect at play here that all all of these farms, each individual farm, is is linked to this broader economy that keeps these other businesses in, in business. You know, the tractor supply yeah. store and the feed store and the veterinary practices and slaughterhouses and delivery systems. And so, you know, all of a sudden you're working back on so many different levels. I feel like it, you know, things spin in a, in a quick and kind of scary way. So one of the yeah. things that you outlined in the trailer for the film is that you're hoping that this film will be a tool for some advocacy work. And I'm wondering if you can kind of talk yeah. about, you know, if you, you have your, you know, your Sarah Teal and Lisa Jackson magic wand, who do you want to see this film and what do you hope they're going to take away from it? Well, I mean, I just had a conversation with a woman from the Natural um, Resources Defense Council the other day. And she, they're working on the transportation issue. And 
she was like, oh, look, you know, will you come and show it to the staff and then we can arrange some screenings because it will humanize the issue and it will make it much more vital for them. So, you know, I would love to show it to groups like that. Um, we are hopefully arranging a big transport summit with um, uh, Representative Charles Gibson, who's a Republican um, congressman, but then also, you know, <laughs> Senator Gil- uh, Kirsten Grillabrand people tweeted us out. So we want to get everyone together somehow, the, the politicians, the, the, the groups, you know, groups like you and Heritage who understand all these issues, um, Fresh Direct, a big part of this, um, to have a conversation about the capacity to grow, the capacity to bring money to upstate New York to, to directly to farmers. Um, you know, we, we, we hope to double the size of the Adirondack grazers next year. And that's, you know, that would be two million into the economy in upstate New York, which is fantastic. And we need people to, um, help and to understand that we need support and we need transportation issues sorted out for us and we need a hub at Hunt Point. And I just want to go around and, and help hold screenings. Maybe we can do one at Roberta's. Hmm. And, and just have everybody talk about it and understand that um, this is a problem and we are going to lose these farms and then the farm communities, as you said, if we don't do something. And... Um, I think this is one way to do something. I think co-ops work quite well, actually, if you can um, get them together. And, you know, we'd like to be a model for other people if they want to do it. We can hand on the... We're, we're writing a how-to. Um, we can hand on the information. Um, yeah. But I just want to hold screenings all over the place. And um, we're, we're having a screening at NOFA in January. Um, that's an ideal. And, um, you know, Lisa and I will be there and some of the farmers will be there and we can just talk talk about, you know, together about how to solve this, how to keep fa- families on farms. You know, my big worry is, is you know, some of the um, Wall Street people who are coming up and buying up farms. And that's, you know, and then put farm managers in place and that's fine. But it, but uh, the ideal is to keep families on farm and yeah. owning them. And I, well, and I too, I think, you know, what you're talking about here isn't a grand charity project, uh, Save the no. Farms, by donating. You're talking about really looking at building, doing some regional economic development, uh, building infrastructure, yeah. building businesses. And I, yeah. as, as someone who grew up in quite a rural area, you know, one of the frust- frustrating aspects for myself and I think many people from my community was that it was a, a community that was dying. There wasn't opportunities for work if you wanted to stay. And I think right. that is like another factor that's bumping up all across rural America is employment. There's a huge need to be driving employment. And if you look at the ag sector, money spent in ag stays in the state. In the, in the, in the state. It has a really interesting multiplier effect. And I just, I really want to hammer that point here because I feel like often when we talk about you know, helping farms and saving farms. No, no, it, you this know, isn't, this it, isn't yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you bring that up. This is not a charity case, and the film is not, you know, some useless advocacy thing. <laughs> um, it, it, is, it is because we are building a business, and we are bringing money into rural New York, and we are employing people, and then the farms in turn are growing and employing people. So, no, this is a business. And the film is just a way, really, to, um, you know, do a shout-out about the problem. But we do have the solution, <laughs> or one of them. <laughs> but so thank you for, yeah, no, this is, this is a practical thing, not, not some kind of charity. Thing. Yeah, and I... And I, this, I you know, the Grazers is farmer-owned. You know, it's not, it's not owned by me. It's not owned by um, anyone. It's owned by a group of people, a group of farmers. So... It's 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 definitely not charity. Well, <laughs> it's to get them a decent price for what they do. Yeah, and I think you know you guys are are proving that your your model has some legs, and so I'm excited to and hopeful for its future. And we have just another couple of minutes here, so I want to talk uh, a little bit about the campaign, how people can give, and and what they're giving to. You've been doing the filming. You know, I think you're looking to raise fifteen thousand dollars, not a ton of money. Um, so can you share with us kind of what that what that money is going to be going towards, and then what's the best way for people to support the campaign? Um, uh, yes, no, it's, I think if you just go on Kickstarter and you look up grazers doc, 
Um, and that's our Twitter handle or at Grazers Doc. Um, you can find you can find the link. Um, we have been raising fifteen thousand to finish the film and to do outreach, which is um, what we're doing into whole screenings. And we've raised. I think we're at. Oh, we're close to eleven thousand right now. Um, and it ends on um, Monday evening. So we're on a big push to um, get that last three and a half, four thousand in there. Um, and then people get, we can send you, there are rewards. And we just increased the rewards for getting beef because that was the most popular one. Um, Gramercy Tavern, Michael Anthony very sweetly um, threw in lunch at Gramercy Tavern and the tour of the kitchen with him and a copy of his cookbook. Um, there's cooking lessons with um, Lisa Jackson's sister, who's um, a, a very – she was on the Food Network and is a fantastic chef. Um, there, are, there are different rewards, and there are, of course, the ubiquitous um, uh, Adirondack Grazers baseball hats and the T-shirts and the muscle shirts. Um, but the beef seems to be the most popular, and we've been <laughs> sending out lots of boxes of beef. Um, and it, it, yeah, it's just to help finish the film and get it out there and get the screenings going. That's the next step. Excellent. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for taking some time out to join us on the show today and congratulations on the success of the co-op so far. And I'm, I'm really excited to see what the next year or two is going to bring. Well, thank you. And I really, you know, Heritage, you, you guys were one of our first customers and our earliest and best and you've, you know, been consistent and fantastic, and we really appreciate it. Oh, well, that's great to hear. That's Heritage Foods USA, uh, founder of the radio network. Um, Well, if you're out there and you want to learn a little bit more about the work that uh, Sarah and the team is doing at the Adirondack Grazers, definitely check out the website, www.adkgrazers.com. There you can find um, a lot of info, a little sneak preview of the film, a link to the Kickstarter campaign, um, Profiles of farmers, uh, lots lots of great information um, there. So definitely check that out, and you can probably also find out where you can get your hands on some of that delicious beef. Thanks so much, <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much again, Sarah, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, this show, like thank all, sure. yeah, thank you. This show, like all thirty five of our our weekly programs, is available for free. Uh, you can find us on iTunes, on Stitcher Smart Radio, but we hope you'll check out our website. Got a lot of great news content that's updating there every day. Uh, you also, if uh, you believe in our work, please consider clicking that donate tab, become a member. We are a member supported organization. Thanks so much for listening and stay tuned in. Thanks for listening to this program on heritageradionetwork.org. You can find all of our archive programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore radio. You can email us questions anytime at info at heritageradionetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a 501c3 nonprofit. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field, and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food.